Hey, everybody. Thank you for your support. Remember to visit Patreon to unlock all the bonus content, including special music and movies. Some of the most important in work on electricity can only be described as quintessential, groundbreaking, and juicy. If you join the fellowship for January 31st, I'll send you some cool custom Tartarian stickers in the mail, and librarians get a special surprise. Also, I did a live stream with Richard Lopez. Tomorrow I'm doing a live stream with Philip Trujinin, so you don't want to miss that. So remember to check that out. Visit the website, xart.us. Last time in Tartaria, we talked about the lost cities around the world and the great mud flood of monuments. And we talked about how throughout history, historically the trend has been that at the top of the food chain are foreign invaders and at the bottom are the native peasants and the indigenous are dominated. Then we talked a bit about Joseph Smith and the Latter-day Saints, or the Mormons, and his beliefs about a Caucasoid white people in the Americas. Now, I want to bring up a rather chad fellow named Eddie Bravo, who you can do a search for with the words Rockefeller education, because he does a great piece about how the elite purchased the schools And he quite well tells the tale of how the elite purchased the schools and the institutions and destroyed them. And it's an interesting story about how they destroyed all of the evidence of anything before the 19th century and completely rewrote history. And a good example is Lemaire, the Belgian priest who actually invented the cosmogenesis theory and E equals MC squared equation that Einstein received so much credit for. Also interesting to note is that Einstein worked in a patent office and had his girlfriend explain them to him which he then fed into intelligence circles. And they replaced them with alchemists, which means the study of Kemet, as opposed to the study of La Hira. Because the is el in la in Arabic and Spanish, forwards and backwards, there actually is no word for the in Latin, just suffixes. Incidentally, there are no vowels in Hebrew either. And that gets us into the Terra, Torah, Tantra of Tartaria. And the concept is basically, because you cannot trust any of your senses except the reflection of everyone else, except those measured by each other, We use a shared lens in order to create a reflective identity that we use to describe each other. But as people are questioning whether they're living in a simulation or stimulation, shared reality is not a simulation. Simulation theory is correlated a lot with video games and people losing connection with their bodies and what happens when they fall playing a video game. And the difference in a generation raised playing Tony Hawk versus falling and hurting themselves on a skateboard. When if we are waves and particles being bombarded, this is more of a stimulation, albeit perhaps greatly distorted one. This is why there is an effort to convince us that we are living inside of a simulation. Because simulation theory prepares us for immoral behavior and a life of action without consequence, albeit the experience may be greatly distorted. So it may be intuitive that a system of awareness via different tools exists for communicating and being understood. And it's a system of symbols, metrics, and movements. Wisdom through symbols, wisdom through metrics and measurements, and wisdom through movements. And scientists have long wrestled with this. Actually, science is a relatively new field if you think about it, at least in Europe, perhaps, if not the Occident. Isaac Newton often studied the works of occultists and had obsessive occultist disorder and had some of the most bizarre esoteric beliefs that would have made Joseph Smith seem tame. He followed the work of René Descartes, who was a worshipper, which means he sought to reciprocate the value for his life by finding real life meaning in a meaningless world and producing a worthy gift, which is very much like the book of Ecclesiastes. In fact, you might as well just read Ecclesiastes because it's shorter and it does a better job. In fact, read Ecclesiastes. But one of the more valuable things that he had said was cogito ergo sum, which meant cognition, therefore he was, which he was proved wrong at 53 when he died, you might say, because we're still talking about him today. And even Schopenhauer might say, we think maybe you still are, and who's to say you were before? And even if you wouldn't, he's dead, so I can say what I want about Schopenhauer. I can say what I want about most of these philosophers. But when I asked my father what it meant when I had those thoughts, those same thoughts, and he showed me Descartes amongst the shelf of of mail away red philosophy books. It startled me greatly because I knew if I was having these kinds of thoughts at my age, with no training, when these great men had taken all of their lives to conclude these thoughts and conquer them, that it was entirely paradoxical to suggest that having thoughts were original, let alone proof of individuality and existence. And these were rather distracting thoughts to have when you're rather young 
And these are rather distracting thoughts to be having when you're supposed to be doing homework because you're forced to wrestle with the question of what's the point of doing homework because one can't help but wonder if not doing the homework was part of some sort of divine purpose or at least the way things were meant to be in some sort of Calvinistic sense of destiny. And where is that range of choice that you have if perhaps you're unable to defy that reality? And, and of course, who are you to question that something or nothingness? Because who's to say it has to be something, I guess, but it borders on the veil of nihilism which even with the existential bliss is a hard sell and perhaps gives away the evidence of some sort of valuable merit-based reality. But I find it funny when people argue about religion or say they don't argue about religion because it all boils down to one choice or any choice at all. Because if you believe that you can make choices, then you believe that after the Big Bang, there's some sort of interaction between yourself and the rest of the world and that the rest of the world is built up of interactions of choices. Because if you believe in the expansion of stars retroactively proving the expansion of the universe from a Big Bang, then it's quite plausible we are nothing more than reactions to stardust bombarding into itself outward from some major point. But even in chaos, there are mathematics to describe the synchronicities that occur between seemingly disparaged identities that despite their apparent lack of correlation are proven mathematically inextricably linked, ordered pairs of fractals outwards responding and interacting with each other, including yourself, and all reality is just models of the solar system in different shapes and forms. So even crazy old Schopenhauer would have to admit that there are some sort of chaotic principles that guide the universe, principles that internetwork the universe in a series of knots, sort of like D. Hawk, founder and CEO of Emeritus Visa International, described in his book Birth of the Chaotic Age. But even if crazy old Schopenhauer wouldn't agree with me, or Axel Sandemus, the sort of innovator of the law of Yante, or certainly Eric Fromm, the writer of The Art of Love, would agree much of the content of the identities are a reflection of what is heard, and so the sense of empathy above all else proves the concept of simulation theory above simulation theory. But even if they wouldn't, they're all dead, so I get to say what I want. Newton studied Descartes' gear earth, which was a concept that the world was inside of a sphere that had a moving gear system around it, and that the North Pole the sacred cross was a gear system that wound up the earth and spun the earth itself. And Isaac Newton received this heavily guarded information through the secret brotherhoods of the fraternal orders, the Rosicrucians, and such other societies, whom protected the intellectual property under death, or worse, copyright. And in fact, this is where we get our piracy laws to this day. So it's important to remember the laws of fair use. By the way, Walt Disney's Mickey Mouse is about to become public domain, most likely. And God help you, so this is a very interesting time to be alive. So there was an iconoclasm of the academia and the removal of many symbols, but many of the symbols are still there. And they removed the great master librarian chroniclers. And by the way, not all, but many of the great librarians throughout history were women. In fact, going back to ancient Baalbek, where the society of giants who built these great stone temples is a giant library. And the library itself was supported by the entire known world, sending information of agriculture and trade and population census and it was managed by women. And so they industrialized the information and then demolished the great libraries and hid the information for centuries. And often the professors were burned, fired, committed, and removed from the schools and institutions. Instead, they were filled with liars who made them what they are today. And this is a process I referred to in my political science paper on technocracy over a decade ago as Rockefellerianism, or the pounding of money into swords. And we talked about the evidence of mud floods or WICOs, a worldwide environmental disaster which devastates and impacts us to this day, and the subject of the lost civilization of Tartaria, which may have been an alarmingly civilized past that has been obscured from memory that's been around us all along, but perhaps only now we're reaching a civilization advanced enough that we're able to see it. But it's been mentioned in history, Tartaria is nothing new. In fact, it's mentioned by Freemasons and maps alike. In fact, it's mentioned on maps and journals across the world, even in the Civil War and the Franco Wars and the Napoleonic period. And while the idea of a great civilization that might have existed only a few centuries ago and then was completely lost might seem paradoxical and perceived as unscientific, there are many that are studying, critically analyzing these things around the world. And we're now looking for the truth about what happened in history and what Tartaria really was. So before we get into the age of civilization, the age of history, how old the world is, and how old we think we are, let's talk about Darwin's stolen theory, Edmonstonism. So Darwin had a neighbor named John Edmonstone, who was a taxidermist from Guyana. Darwin described him, his teacher and an intimate, who he spent long pleasurable hours with by his side. Anyway, John Edmondson was a taxidermist, which meant he studied the bodies of animals in order to identify the different traits within a species or subspecies in kind through a process called morphology, which chronicles the gradual change of a family of species into a diversity of kinds. Perhaps not simultaneously, Helen Blavatsky certainly within several years went on a voyage of her own similar to Darwin's. 
However, it's important to remember that the Gregorian and Julian calendar switch did not actually happen in one day, and in fact was not adopted in Slavic countries until the 20th century. And there's a pool of research that demonstrates that we are missing more than just days, but actually years from this calendar. So perhaps Darwin and Madame Blavatsky were on the same boat, who knows. At very least, they were like ships in the night. Because Darwin, who it might seem bizarre to describe as an occultist or an esotericist, was at least a proto-theosophist, because Darwin was supposedly an atheist. And far be it from me to speak for atheists, as I am not one of them, but I think there is a certain difference between nihilism and the belief in nothingness than in the atheist religion, the religion without a god, which is what atheism is. And as Albert Pike described, a jargon of rude chemistry to describe to the materialists who wish to experiment to prove what pretentious philosophers had already concluded for thousands of years. There must be a hypothesis of confirmational bias that leads towards a positive resolution, and there must be materialists in order to evoke that positive evolution through material science and through trial, error, and work, in order to reach some sort of a unified conclusion that transcends matter and energy, or mind, matter, and spirit. And so the great work is uniting the opposites, and while that might only apply to the smartest of atheists, it's important to remember that there are dumb people of all faiths, and while there are those out there that seem to protect themselves from knowing what they seemingly already must, the more clever ones who use this sort of information to reach great potential have tried to use atheism as a means of de-anthropomorphizing God in order to look at man, in order to stop looking for man in the reflection of God but the actual universe, under the philosophy that man is made in the image of God, not the other way around, not that God is made in the image of man. If you start to use the tools right, they do very specific things, regardless of why you do them, even if you do them for the wrong reason. There are consequences to actions, regardless of intention. And this might all seem like a lot of esoteric occult hubbubaloo, considering that these guys are supposed to be scientists, but back then you have to understand that's mainly all they studied, because they didn't have as much science to study yet, because they didn't know how to discern the difference between the scientific text they had and the occult text. And how would you, if you've never seen a pyramid before, and all of a sudden someone tells you they know how to build pyramids, and they know how to do medicine, and they know how to make electricity, and you've seen pyramid, and all of a sudden you're the only guy in your block that's not getting sick. You see, with science, it's kind of like how everyone else gets their information, only their information is hidden, so we're not able to know about it. Philosophers like Isaac Newton, Descartes, and Galileo all believe the same things as John Dee, that the universal center sun was at the core of man. And if a lot of our science is based on these occult ideas, then it might matter to know that, because it might be that we're looking inside out or upside down at something that we should be looking at a completely different way and seeing things that totally add up because of measurements but but just because we can perceive something to be true that's not saying much for a while it was forbade from making symbols of man or god under islamic law so the study of arabesques or sacred geometry became very important for understanding the world in both ourselves and understanding god through the world instead of through ourselves and that was very interesting to helena petrovna blavatsky because the concept of the monad had become very famous and the monad is very similar to an atom, but it's slightly more complex than an atom. Because rather than describe only the identity of an atom, it describes an identity of an atom over time. It's sort of the process of an orbital over time. So it can catalyze the energy over time instead of a sudden cataclysmic burst of energy. Rather than finishing instantly, it allows for the energy to be exchanged over a longer period of time through ordered symmetry. And reciprocity that bonds and socializes atoms into fantastic forms and shapes. And the esoteric occult sciences of Isaac Newton who tooled and labored away in seances with angels and fairies and occult experiments with crystals, rainbows, fires, and lights, and who couldn't figure out exactly how many millions or hundreds of millions or billions of years old the universe was, but was damn sure he knew when the world was ending and it was soon. These occult ideas of Darwin's stolen Edmonstonianism and the monad and Isaac Newton's occult scientific research gave rise to Blavatsky's esoteric evolutionary theory of her own. That essentially the human race is one mankind that evolved millions of years ago and mutated into the different forms we see today, and that someday the sixth race of man would evolve in California. And though she did say that it would happen in Baja, California, I think it's important to remember that, that California is a militarized zone, much like North Korea and South Korea, and that Power Rangers Angel Grove was shot in Santa Clarita, California, which is a part of California's Valencia region. And Valencia was a capital city of the Moorish Spanish Empire. So that's kind of cool, because basically what that means is according to Madame Blavatsky's Theosophical Society, that would make me the evolved sixth race of man. And I have dibs on being the Green Ranger. But Madame Blavatsky's evolutionary theory is very much like Darwin's evolutionary theory, or at least the beginning of Darwin's evolutionary theory, because it describes the relationship between atoms in the biosphere and molecules to cells, which are basically fractal versions of microscopic solar systems. 
So it's the model of evolution of energy into matter into life, spirit into being, or immaterial into material. And from the socialization of atoms into the complex body politic of organisms to the complex body politic of organisms and their relationships with each other. And according to Blavatsky, there were other lands that were lost, such as Lemuria, where of course there were giants, but that they were lost and after Atlantis, we the sixth are evolving from the fifth root race, which are comprised of the five races that were described in the 19th century. It's the concept that there is many kinds, but this is one race, that we are all in it, and we are evolving towards the goal of a superior peak form. And it's a race that requires us all to become one sixth race in the future, where not one wins above another. So, in many ways, Madame Blavatsky invented the human race. Also, if you're interested in learning more about the evolution from the polar Hyperborean, Lemurian, Atlantean, also if you're interested in learning more about Madame Blavatsky, I recommend checking out Gary Light's channel. It's videos on the root races of mankind, or just looking for the seven root races, or Lemuria and Atlantis. But a lot of this has to do with the occult cosmology of spheroids and the idea of expanding consciousness. And Blavatsky had written of giant missing continents sunk underneath the ocean where the human race actually came from. Which is interesting when you look at the idea of the expanding Earth, which if you look, there's a lot of room for missing continents, and in fact, Mercator maps have even shown evidence, and in fact, geologists have found many, that there could be this legendary land of Mu. And for those of you who were startled how casually I mentioned the flat Earth and globe in the same sentence, please remember that I promise we'll explain more about the Mercator right projections of Mercator and many projections of maps from projections of the Earth in different ways that have different benefits. But until I have time to make that video, the keyword is projections, and I'll remind you that John D. did visit Mercator at 17. However, I would like to show you a very quick clip that I believe would be something of a clue. You have to understand the rules of the game. This sphere is made of an abstract elastic material that can stretch and bend and pass through itself. But you cannot rip or puncture this material without destroying it. I'll push the two halves right through each other. What about that ring around the equator? Remember, you mustn't tear or crease it. It is surprising, but watch this. Is this a sphere turning inside out? You bet. That wasn't easy to follow, was it? And so in the meantime, I'll leave you with those pieces of information and ask you to reflect upon that before we move on to another subject and come back to it later. Thank you for your support. Remember to visit Patreon to unlock all the bonus content, including special music and movies. If you join the fellowship before January 31st, I'll send you some cool custom Tartarian stickers in the mail. And librarians get a special surprise. Tomorrow I'm doing a live stream with Philip Drujinen, so you don't want to miss that. Visit the website xart.us.